So let's read one of those moments, shall we? One of those moments in the New Testament that I think, and I'm going to meet you in Matthew 7, and this is at the Sermon on the Mount, and I'll just tell you straight up, the Sermon on the Mount has been a troublesome passage for a lot of people who have moved into, well, first of all, it's a troublesome passage for a lot of people who've moved into Christianity, because when you really start to take the Sermon on the Mount seriously, Jesus is asking a lot. Jesus is showing you a world that doesn't look like the world you came out of. He's showing you a world where we don't get to, we don't get to have the response we used to have, or we don't function in the way we used to function. These are the peculiarities of the Sermon on the Mount that have caused some to even say that this is one of those messages. And I've heard this, and I have admit have even said this. We would say things like the Sermon on the Mount is one of those moments in the ministry of Jesus where he's preaching to an old covenant world, and so you need to really be careful with how you handle the Sermon on the Mount because it's not all really for you. And that means we have he who is full of grace and truth spending an enormous amount of our gospel's time telling us stuff that doesn't matter. Okay, I, I, I think you can already tell there's probably something we could do better with the statements of Jesus than that then land on, well, I don't know if I need this. Let's just, you know, most of this seventh chapter, I don't really need this. Most of this eighth chapter doesn't really apply to me. And I, and I think we can do better. Here's one of those moments that cause such consternation. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life and there are few who find it. We have discounted, I think, or misinterpreted verses like this for too long. The very famous, straight is the gate, narrow is the way passage, broad is the way, straight is the gate that leads to life, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And we've either discounted it or we've misinterpreted it. Now, I opened tonight with how I think we're discounting Jesus sometimes because of that lap, and we're going, well, that, I don't know if that applies to me. And I've given you at least one illustration of a moment where it's pretty blatantly obvious it doesn't apply to you. You don't need to go show yourself to a natural priest in a temple. You don't have either one of those. So that's definitely a cultural, contextual thing. But, all, but many of the other moments, we need to wrestle out what we ought to do with that in light of the fact that we're under a new covenant and that Jesus is speaking to us. So part of it is that we, can, is that we discount that. The other part is that we misinterpret it. Straight as gate narrows away. And, and here's what I mean by misinterpret. If I were to go around the room tonight and ask you, snap response, don't put a ton of thought, just give the first thing you think because you've been in church a while, you probably read this 50 times, you've already got a pretty good idea. What does straight as gate narrows away mean? I think it would almost happen accidentally that out of our mouths there would be something about eternity, something about heaven and hell, salvation and lost. You know, straight as the gate, narrow as the way, not, everybody, not a lot of people are going to heaven, not very many people are saved, broad as the way, wide as the path, probably a whole bunch of people are lost, more people than we know about. Um, that there's, there's one, and then we would try to theologically tighten it up a little bit. We'd go, there's one way to get to heaven and his name is Jesus, and then there's a whole bunch of ways to get to hell and it's everything but Jesus. And we probably would feel like we've tightened the screws on that theology a little bit and we're coming down a little bit closer to what Jesus might have meant. And then when we get enamored of grace, we get saturated in grace and we become finished work people. It's not as easy to handle that text through the lens of, oh, there's only a few people saved. Most people are lost. Oh, uh, there's only, it's, there's, it's hard to get to heaven. It's easy to get to hell. We start, once we become enamored of grace, we go, wait a minute, his yoke is easy, his burden is light. You know, here I am out here telling everybody, God's not mad at you. Jesus loves you. And then on the next breath, I'm going, yeah, it's really hard to get to heaven, though. And so which one is it? It's either, it's, it's either not really hard to get to heaven because God loves you and why don't you just say yes, or it's super tough and you're barely going to make it. So, you know, you probably shouldn't try unless you're real serious. Um, and can you see how that's, <laughs> that's, those are two tough things to hold in your hand at the same time which is God's not mad. He really loves you. Man, he wants you to come home and it's really hard and not very many people are going to make it. And I know a bunch of people that tried and they're all backslid and you probably will too because this is not easy. 
And, and, and I know the answer is to go, well, just get rid of that other one. Well, how do you do that in light of a verse like this when Jesus talks very clearly about a straight gate and narrow way and then a broad path and destruction and life? Is there something we can do better? I think both approaches are wrong. I think discounting Jesus is the wrong way to handle Jesus. Don't run from him, run to him. Pay closer attention to Jesus, not less attention to Jesus. Watch how he walks, watch how he talks, listen to his voice. Don't read his scriptures in a vacuum, take them all in. Don't ignore his time, place, and culture. Embrace his time, place, and culture. Don't ignore the fact that he's a Jewish man speaking to a Jewish audience on the cusp of a new kingdom. Embrace the fact that he's a Jewish man speaking to a Jewish audience on the cusp of a new kingdom. Watch how Jesus does it, and then we'll stop just quoting a verse here and a verse there, and we'll start to take the whole body of what Jesus is trying to say. We might realize that discounting Jesus is the wrong approach. And the other way, that whole... Make it a verse about salvation and make it a verse about the afterlife. 